Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, my name is Shaur Munir. I'm a fourth year PhD student at University of California, Davis. And uh, I'll be presenting our initial evaluation of using large language models as a defense against online tracking. And although the, uh, the a lot of people here are already avail um, aware of how online tracking works and how defenses against online tracking works, but I will just... Uh, look into a little bit of how, how traditional defenses against online tracking work and why do we need to go towards LLM or what benefit might they provide. So traditionally how online tracking works is that a user goes to a website uh, and a request is generated which goes to a tracker and that request can contain identifying information such as users, uh, cookies which are stored which contain identifiers or email addresses or any other personal information about the user which is collected. And the tracker can ultimately respond back with some more information which is to be stored on the user's browser storage. Uh, normally, uh, filter lists uh, are a very good way to prevent this kind of tracking, where if the request endpoint matches uh, an entry in a filter list, that request is blocked, the tracker does not get the information, and ultimately this type of online tracking is prevented. And as we already know that what filter lists are, they are a curated list of rules to prevent online tracking and they are mainly manually created and updated. And because of this manual uh, intervention or manual requirement, the scalability is a huge challenge in filter lists. And over the years, there have been a lot of different approaches to try to mitigate this issue and try to automatically generate and update filter lists. AdGraph once one approach, which was published in IEEE SNP in 2020, uh, Brave has a page graph which is built around AdGraph, uh, which was around 2020 as well. Then WebGraph, which was in using security 2022, tried to solve this um, issue as well. And we will briefly look at how WebGraph normally works. So um, how WebGraph works is that you crawl a web page, you uh, extract some of the features, you create a graph representation of the web page, you use uh, that to train a language mo uh, uh, train a machine learning model, and then that machine learning model is then able to classify outgoing requests as either tracking or non-tracking. So if you already have these machine learning solutions, then why do we need LLMs? So we know that training machine learning models require extensive data collection and feature engineering. Uh, I was part of the team that worked on a web graph as well, but so I'm, I'm, I have some first-hand experience with this kind of problem. And then generation of an interactive graph or interaction graph for a web page while uh, the page is loading is also not possible. AdGraph tried to do that at that time, but the performance implications were too large to consider that WebGraph switched to a completely offline generation of uh, uh, classification or generation of rules for filter lists. And finally, uh, while regular machine learning models, they are not aware of the context other than what will be provided to them through feature engineering. On the other hand, uh, there are pre-trained language models which are already trained on a huge corpus of data. And LLMs can also work with some loosely structured data to extract meaning so that we don't need that extensive of feature engineering uh, exercise there. And LLMs can also combine extensive context from their training data to uh, look at a task at hand. And we will look how this helps uh, LLM uh, try to identify online tracking as well later on. Uh, one other benefit that uh, is not mentioned here is that LLMs can also then be repurposed. The same pipeline can also be repurposed to generate filter list tools as well. So you identify the uh, tracking requests and then you also generate a filter list tool which can be then used to update the existing filter list tools. Now, uh, what we did was we evaluated uh, the existing language models against WebGraph. We compared, specifically we compared OpenAI's GPT-4 against WebGraph. Uh, WebGraph as we mentioned, that classifies the request based on graph features. But GPT-40 was given only the URL without any additional training. Uh, and it, its job was to classify that request URL based on just that uh, information. And then we measured the performance by comparing the solution against what is already available in the filter lists. So this is the whole pipeline. We crawl a web page. We collect the data for the web graph pipeline. We collect the final decision and... Uh, we also then, on in parallel, we uh, use that request data to obfuscate some of the information and generate a prompt. That prompt is fed to GPT-40, and then GPT-40 also gives us the final decision. And then that decision is compared against filter lists. So looking at the results, um, 
on our data set, the, 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 the set of URLs that we observed, web graph was 96% accurate. Uh, on the other hand, GPT-4 was able to achieve 89% accuracy. And the recall was very comparable to uh, web graph. The precision, although, was a little bit lower. So this could result into some breakage issues, uh, which is something that we need to further explore. Uh, and uh, we also mentioned that in the pipeline, we also try to obfuscate uh, the URLs. And why is that? Because trackers can modify the URL to evade detection. One very simple way is to either switch or hide their domain. So what we also did was to, we took a URL, we obfuscated a domain first, and because there are also some query parameters and other information in the URL itself, which can be used, we also did another step where we removed any of the identifying information or the uh, visible information from the query parameters as well. Uh, and what we observed was that um, after obfuscating the domain, there was only a 3.3% drop in accuracy for GPT-40. And when we further obfuscate the query parameters, there's only 1.16% of drop. So there is, uh, there is certainly some robustness associated to language models as well. Um, uh, an important point to note here is that WebGraph did not use any of the content features of the URL, so there was no drop in accuracy for WebGraph here. Now, uh, another very interesting aspect of using LLMs is that they are able to explain why they made a decision, which is somewhat not possible in machine learning models. So what we also did was to ask the LLMs to or GPT-40 to explain its decision with every single classification. And then we analyzed those decisions where WebGraph and GPT seem to uh, disagree. And ultimately, we uh, categorized them into two different types of uh, decisions that GPT-40 was making. So one was that it was using some of the information that it had already observed during its training process. So for example, consider this URL from Facebook. This is labeled as tracking in filter list. WebGraph mistakenly identified this as non-tracking, but GPT-40 was able to identify this as tracking. And when we asked the reason, the reason was that this URL is used by Facebook's conversion tracking. And the uh, endpoint also is commonly associated with conversion tracking as well. But this can also uh, result into some problems. So it can also misuse some of the recalled information. So for example, this particular URL was to the avatar, uh, avatar uh, endpoint of the HubSpot, and it was non-tracking. WebGraph also said that it was non-tracking, but GPT-40 here made a mistake and said that it was tracking. And the reason was that this URL belongs to HubSpot, which is a well-known marketing sales and service platform. Other type of um, uh, decisions that GPT-4 was making was understanding the link structure. So consider this URL from Facebook. Again, this is a tracking URL uh, where there's a lot of query parameters added. There's a, this is a big, bigger uh, URL. And WebGraph made a mistake here to consider this a non-tracking, but GPT-40 thought it was tracking because the URL contained uh, certain query parameters which could be used to, for user engagement, analyzing their behavior and performance metrics. Again, uh, following the similar structure, this can also result into some misunderstanding by, on GPT-40's part as well. Where this is another uh, URL which is, uh, which is loading a CSS file. WebGraph considered that as tracking, uh, GPT-40 considered as non-tracking, but the reason was that this is only loading a CSS file and CSS files cannot include tracking mechanisms or scripts that collect user data. Uh, important point to note here is that uh, WebGraph had additional context here, which was the interaction graph of the whole web page. So it was able to understand that this can contain other information such as cookie values, headers, additional stuff, which could be used for tracking. But GPT-40 obviously, based on just the URL, was unaware of this. So coming to the major takeaways of this uh, evaluation, uh, we see that given limited to no context, it seems that LLMs are able to perform very well against solutions that require a lot of feature engineering and larger context. And they can also recall some useful information that they know about tracking URLs. And they can make their decision based on URL structure as well as link decoration and resource paths. So we, we, we think that LLMs can demonstrate some very strong zero-shot learning capabilities for identifying tracking URLs. And this can be really important, uh, which we will discuss next. So this is an ongoing work, and we are looking into some future directions. And this is directly from the results that we observed here. So one of them is that we are 
looking into providing additional context to the LLMs. As we saw that based on just the URLs, the LLMs were able to identify 90, uh, close to 89% of the URLs as tracking or non-tracking. So better guidelines through prompt generation is one aspect that we are currently uh, evaluating. And the interaction graph of the web page itself, which is used by web graph, uh, we are also looking into providing LLMs with that information and then analyzing how that uh, performance changes. And ultimately, as we saw in one example, that they were able to identify that some query parameters can also be used for tracking as well. Uh, and we have previously worked on uh, some, of the, uh, some of the research projects which had looked into identifying link decoration as tracking as well. So there are some other forms of tracking other than just the request URLs, which we are trying to expand language models to as well. And uh, another part of that is a custom training pipeline. So uh, I, the LLMs, they were not trained with tracking in mind. So embedding the awareness of tracking through the, through the training pipeline as well uh, can further improve their performance. And it can also perform uh, improve their performance on some very niche cases, which they are currently do not performing well on. And ultimately, I think uh, uh, one of the goals that we have in this project is to replicate this performance in smaller LLMs. So currently we are testing with GPT-40. We are also on uh, in parallel trying to replicate the same results in smaller LLMs because there are some uh, there are some uh, smaller LLMs which are already integrated into browsers. So for example, Google's, uh, Google's Gemini Nano is integrated into Chrome right now. So once, uh, because we have shown that there's a very strong zero shot, no feature classification, which is possible through LLMs. So generating runtime decisions for some of the tracking behavior can be useful. And that can be done with smaller LLMs. And the, this can ultimately provide us with a very good alternative to traditional anti-tracking techniques. Um, this was my talk. Um, please feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you.